Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you up front can hear me. Can those behind you? Yeah, okay, good. There we are. All right, good. Welcome. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, we're getting ready to begin. And many of you have gravitated over to the, well, there's a lot of product over there. And uh, as Patty rightly said, there's something for everybody over there. So check out that uh, the products over there and, uh, and hopefully you'll walk away with an item or two. Well, I want to uh, begin with prayer. Uh, and uh, before I offer prayer, though, I want to uh, make sure that uh, you have an understanding of, of our love for Dr. Joseph Kazeel and his wife, Patty. And uh, they've been coming faithfully down here or sending someone's down to this area to help us uh, learn more about uh, creation science for the last 10 years. And so uh, excited to see them back. And so he'll be able to tell you more about who he is. He is president of the Arizona Origin Science Association, uh, otherwise known as ASOSA, and uh, he can talk more about that. But anyway, let me offer prayer and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for, uh, for your grace to see us into your house today, and in particular, Lord, to, to, be, to be students, uh, students of what your word teaches us and how that marries with the science that you have created and so thank you for uh, what you're about to teach us through your servant Joseph. Blessings on he and, and Patty and, uh, and their ministry to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, folks. It's great to be a Bible-believing Christian always, but especially now because we have so much more science that confirms what Scripture says because we know that Scripture is totally accurate from the very beginning to the end. And uh, it's, it's so much fun. It's a joy. You know, almost every day, as I review for my courses that I teach at Arizona Christian University, I learn something new, and I just am re-amazed at how God put things together. And then I'm re-amazed the second time and how people figure it out. Uh, it's amazing stuff. So we're going to start here with uh, what's called the Miller-Urey experiment, which was performed in 1953. But I'm going to give you a little history before then. It starts in 1920 with uh, a fellow in Russia named Alexander Ivanovich Uparin. And he was a chemist, and he, being a uh, secular scientist who was in agreement with you know, the communists saying that there's no God, everything happened by itself, was eager to try and come up with the beginnings of an explanation how non-living chemicals could evolve into biological molecules which eventually would come together to form life. And, th and the evolutionists have been trying to figure this out ever since. But we know that that didn't happen, so it's a futile effort on their part. But what's nice is along the way they keep learning more and more and stuff which just simply confirms what scripture says and proves that it had to be supernatural creation of life. So let's take a look. So in 1924, this uh, fellow Oparin uh, published and said, you know, there's got to be a way that chemical evolution has happened. And they call it the primordial soup, meaning this mixture of, of molecules in the ocean or pond, whichever way they like to think of it. And uh, these things magically came together by random chance events. So he asserted that there is no fundamental difference between a living organism and lifeless matter. In other words, you're just a bag of chemicals worth about $3.69 is their viewpoint. And I was actually told that in my high school biology course uh, up in Phoenix. The complex combination of manifestations and properties characteristic of life must have arisen as a part of the process of the evolution of matter. So notice it's this assertion, must have arisen. That, that's one of those magic verbs that makes evolution happen in their way of thinking. So they assume evolution and then try to interpret everything in light of evolution. It's circular reasoning is what they use that and great imagination 
So taking into account the recent discovery of methane in the atmospheres of Jupiter and other giant planets, Oparin suggested that the infant Earth had possessed a strongly reducing atmosphere, meaning no oxygen, uh, it would be an oxidizing atmosphere, no oxygen, but containing methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. Well, those types of molecules uh, would provide the right kind of atoms to make amino acids. And the reason they exclude oxygen is because being good chemists, they know that oxygen would combine with whatever would be produced and make it useless. But one of the interesting things is in the evolutionary time frame, in other words, billions of years that the solar system is supposedly 4.7 billion years old, in that time frame, the ultraviolet light from the sun would cause the methane and ammonia to be destroyed, to decay. And so that doesn't work. That's another big strike against their way of trying to have this explained by natural means. So he said that the first only simple solutions of organic matter, the behavior was governed by the properties of the component atoms, arrangement of these atoms into molecular structure. So what he was trying to say was it's the inherent nature of these molecules that made chemical evolution happen. But again, that's all assumption and it actually has no basis in fact. So then he said the resulting growth and increased complexity of molecules brought new properties into being and then new colloidal, meaning protein-like, chemical order developed as a successor to more simple relationships. So what he's saying is things became more complex by themselves. But this is against the second law of thermodynamics, and don't let that word freak you out, but what this means is he's saying that things became all on their lonesome by random chance events more complicated. But what happens in real life, we know that things left to themselves become more simple. They break down. Organization falls apart. Our bodies, cars, clothes, homes fall apart. They don't become more complex. So again, this is against what we know actually happens with science. So then he said this brought biological orderliness into being. Well, again, it's all assumption and dealing with the, the way of thinking that the communists think, uh, and I don't mean thought in the process in the past, I mean think like today, because communism is alive and well on this planet today, even among certain segments of our own society. Well, here's a British fellow, J.B.S. Haldane, a brilliant guy, mathematician, biologist, and so he also published on this topic in 1929, and he was the one who coined this phrase, the primordial soup. There was this ancient solution of molecules in this watery, atmosphere, watery uh, environment. And used this term abiogenesis, which means the evolution of, of life from non-life. Abio, without life. So that cellular life came into being from these non-living molecules. Well, Stanley Miller was a graduate student working on his PhD in chemistry uh, under the supervision of Dr. Urey. And Dr. Urey is a very uh, renowned chemist. He's the one who discovered heavy hydrogen, deuterium, which was needed for the atomic uh, uh, bomb program uh, in the 40s. And uh, so he was doing his graduate work there, and, and he put together this experiment, and this is uh, Dr. Miller, years later, reenacting his experiment, or I should say posing for, uh, not reenacting, but posing for this uh, picture here. And so I'm going to go through the various points of this to show what the experiment actually demonstrated, because even today, even now, still in the textbooks, in high school and college biology textbooks, in the chemistry textbooks, they have this experiment saying this is how amino acids actually were created in the lab, and this is how evolution can happen at the chemical level into a living cell. They still say this, even though it's not possible. So I'm going to show you all of the problems, as Paul Harvey would say, you know, the rest of the story. 
So as was mentioned in that quote of uh, Oparin, here you see ammonia, methane, hydrogen gas, carbon dioxide, and water. So these were the molecules that were put together in this chamber, this glass chamber, with uh, spark uh, elements built into the chamber walls. So these would provide the nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Now, the oxygen in molecular form, in other words, O2, the oxygen that we breathe in the atmosphere, the air in this room in the atmosphere is 21% oxygen. That oxygen was excluded because these being good chemists would know that that oxygen would combine with the products of the experiment, render them useless, and they would have no results that would help them in their theory. So these are the gases that were put into there, and then you can see in the diagram that there's a candle representing a Bunsen burner re representing heat to put all of these into gaseous form so that they could react when uh, the sparks would hit them in that chamber and the, these molecules would combine to form amino acids. And as I already mentioned, the problem with the ammonia and the methane in the evolutionary time frame of billions of years is that the ultraviolet light from the sun would break those down and they would not be present any longer in the evolutionary time frame. Another problem here is the concentration of hydrogen. He phenomenally increased the amount of hydrogen in his experiment. Um, what do we put in these balloons that you use for birthday parties and other celebrations? That helium, right? Well, helium is element number two, but it's lighter than the atmosphere. That's why the balloons are always pulling up and you need to tie them down. Well, hydrogen's even lighter, being element number one. So where, where do those balloons go when your string holding them breaks? Yeah, they go all the way up into the uppermost atmosphere and out into the cosmos. So the point I'm making is there is minimal helium and hydrogen in the atmosphere because it's lighter than the rest of the atmosphere and gravity doesn't hold on to it. So it goes on out, escapes. So there being negligible amounts of hydrogen in reality, this is another one of the major fudge factors, is him having a tremendously increased amount of hydrogen in his experiment. So the hydrogen do doesn't exist in appreciable amounts because of gravity not being able to hold on to it. And this is showing you the composition of the atmosphere. So what you're breathing is 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. Everything else in the atmosphere is 1%, and 9 tenths of that 1% is argon. Everything else is one tenth of one percent of the atmosphere, and and hydrogen is a minuscule, minuscule, almost immeasurable fraction of that. And so, it's the gravity unable to hold on to it. Okay, the oxygen, as I mentioned before, was excluded because, being a good chemist, he knew that it would react with the amino acids produced and render them useless. Oxidation. So when you have a piece of steel out there in your construction that's going on and if it sits long enough exposed to the water vapor in the air, it does what? Rust. It rusts. And rust is the common name that we use for oxidation. So iron oxide, that's what rust is. So amino acids were formed here, and you see a list of amino acids in the far right portion of this uh, diagram, that those were what were uh, produced in the experiment, and the ones that are in the gray uh, uh, rows are the ones that we actually have in our bodies. So those are biological amino acids. The other ones are not used in our bodies, uh, at least not for structural purposes. And uh, only less than 2% of the products of the experiment were amino acids. Uh, but with uh, this could happen only with the absence of oxygen in the form of O2. So that's why it was excluded. And then here's a, a quote from a secular scientist. 
saying the only trend in the recent literature is a suggestion of far more oxygen in the early atmosphere than anyone could have imagined. Well, what they're talking about is investigating the rock layers. As they go down, they assume that the deeper it is, the older it is, and we're talking older in terms of millions and billions of years, that those rocks in those deeper layers that they think are the same age as what they think the atmosphere was when they think, 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 that the uh, chemical evolution occurred showed that there's lots of oxygen in those rocks, therefore there was oxygen in the atmosphere, therefore their assumption of no oxygen in the atmosphere is not correct after all. All right, so here we have an atmosphere with no oxygen, since they assume there's no oxygen, and so here's a representation of the Earth, and that uh, pale blue band around the Earth represents the layer of ozone in the very, very high layers of the atmosphere, the stratosphere. And those of you who have gray or white hair like me remember when, uh, I guess it was the 80s, there's, you know, every decade has its own disaster that's going to wipe out the Earth. And I think it was the 80s when the ozone layer, we were going to die from that disappearing because of the uh, molecules in our spray cans. Well, the ozone is real, and the ozone does protect us, uh, and it's instead of O2, atmospheric oxygen, it's O3, three atoms of oxygen in one molecule. And so its job is to protect us from that ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So the problem for the evolutionist model here is, assuming an atmosphere with no oxygen, there's no protection against the ultraviolet light, and so any molecules that would be produced in this primordial soup would be destroyed by the ultraviolet light. Okay, so what you end up with is crispy critters. Okay, all right. So the thing is, life cannot form spontaneously with oxygen, because the oxygen will combine with any molecules produced out there, and life cannot start without oxygen because of the protection necessary for the ozone. So we win, they lose. <laughs> okay, another issue is using this constant electrical current uh, from the spark chamber as a means of causing the molecular reactions to occur, providing the energy to make these uh, components combine to make amino acids. That's not really realistic uh, comparing to uh, lightning. Uh, tremendous intensity in lightning compared to a little spark chamber there. But because of that intensity, that brings the next issue, and that is a condenser and a trap. So the, by condenser, it means that there was a source of very cold water that was uh, then piped into a jacket around the tubing here to cool down the gases so that the products made in the experiment, the amino acids, would then leave the spark chamber and then go into the trap so they would be protected from being destroyed by the electricity that made them. All right? So, you know, I mean, this was a very well thought out experiment. So, if you're out there in the primordial soup and the lightning comes along and zaps and, and causes the molecules to be put together, the next lightning zap can cause them to be destroyed as well. So that's why the condenser and trap was put into the experiment. So this, I call this cheating, uh, to uh, protect from the electrical discharge. So what was actually produced? Well, mostly toxic byproducts. 80% of the experiment uh, produced tar. Okay, like the stuff we drive on, you know, when they repair roads, asphalt, tar. Or the stuff you get in the cigarettes uh, if you smoke, you know, you're getting that tar, which we know is great for causing cancer. So 80% was tar, and then formic acid was another significant product of the experiment. And I will bet there isn't a person in this room who has not had personal experience up close with formic acid. Do you know what I'm talking about? Ant bites, that's right. That's right, formic acid, that's what the ants inject into you when they bite you. And it stings. Yeah, it really does. So formica, or formica, is the Latin word for ant. Some of you, if you speak Spanish, hormiga. 
Ant. See how the, the words are related. Well, amino acids were produced, but what kinds of amino acids? You know, there are different ways to categorize amino acids, such as whether they have no charge, uh, they have a, uh, some polarity, or they have an actual formal positive or negative charge. Another way to categorize them is whether they dissolve in water or in oil. And so roughly half of the amino acids we use dissolve in water and the other half in oil. But the ratio produced by this experiment, they almost all were the ones that dissolve in oil uh, or fat. And so um, the wrong ratio of the kinds of amino acids uh, were produced. And then there's this problem of handedness. Okay, so I want everybody to take your two hands, put your fingertips together in front of your face like so, and you can see that the hands are the same, but they are the mirror images of each other. And so if you separate your hands and then lay one on top of the other, you can see that they don't jive, they don't fit. So being a mirror image of each other, it's very important whether it is a left-handed amino acid or a right-handed amino acid. Because in our structural proteins, all of the amino acids are left-handed. All of them. And you cannot use one right-handed amino acid in that structural protein. It'll mess it up. Well, when you have this kind of experiment, what's going to happen just naturally is you'll get 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed. And so that is a very major problem in addition. See, all these problems, they don't tell you about in the textbooks. All these problems. So, that, so therefore, you can't get a protein to be made because of the wrong-handedness. So only the left-handed amino acids in structural proteins. And so here is an image of what I just had you do with your own hands uh, with the left and right handedness here. And there's over 2,000 types of amino acids, but there's, depending upon if you count early stage of life or not, there's 20 or 21 that we use in our structural proteins. And um, here it's showing the mirror images and so if you get the wrong handed amino acid in there, you're messed up. That's the technical word for these mirror image molecules in antimers. And then, uh, we're not, I'm not even getting into the business of probabil probability other than to say that to have a protein that's functional, every amino acid has to be in the right sequence, every one of them. If you have one that's out of sequence or the wrong one, it messes it up. And so since there are 20 amino acids in our structural proteins, first of all, you have a 1 in 20 chance of getting the right amino acids in the first slot. Then the second one, a 1 in 20 chance. So the chance of getting both of them right are 1 in 400. 1 in 20 times 1 in 20. All right, to get all three of the first amino acids right, now it's going to be one in 8,000. You can see how very quickly this becomes a huge number. And the average size of a, a protein is 300 amino acids. So the number becomes literally astronomical. But you need more than just amino acids. You need other things. For example, you need a membrane around the cell because, like today's um, discussion, I'll use the word discussion about having a border wall. You know, you don't have a country without a border. It's the same thing with a cell. You have to have a membrane around the cell to define what is cell and what is not in cell and to control what gets in cell and out of cell. Well, phospholipids are the type of molecule that makes up most of the material that, that makes a membrane. And you can throw these molecules we call phospholipids together into water and they will spontaneously form a sphere like this because of the chemical properties of those molecules. But that does not a membrane make because you have to have something to be able to control what gets through that membrane in and out of it. So that by itself just simply forms a shell but it doesn't help. Now this is what happens 
under the microscope when those molecules are thrown in the water and you see these spheres develop. But that's all that happens. There's nothing to control what gets inside or outside of that sphere. And that's what's needed for life to happen. And then there are many, many other parts of a cell that are needed. And, you know, this could be an hour lecture all in itself. But just to say there's lots of other parts called organelles, little organs, that have very specific functions that are necessary for a cell to be able to thrive and survive and reproduce. But the other thing I have yet to mention uh, fully, I just mentioned it in brief, is intelligent input. Somebody with smarts had to design the experiment. All right? And so here we have this cartoon from a few decades ago, from 1976. If I can just synthesize life here, then I'll have proven that no intelligence was necessary to form life in the beginning. Okay, does that not seem kind of uh, ironic, let's say? So here is an updated version of this cartoon, with now with all the computers and all the digital equipment, same caption. So there has to be intelligence. So here's a quote, uh, strange coincidences. Well, we have a lot of really, really and you could add about 5,000 more reallys. Strange coincidences here, and all of these coincidences are such that they make life possible. Okay, I mentioned to you that the average length of a protein number of amino acids is 300. I, I forgot to mention to you that there are several thousand proteins in each cell. So to have all this happen to make a living cell is simply beyond possibility. So here is a, a quote uh, from a secular source. Exactly how life emerged on Earth more than three billion years ago is a mystery. Simply adding energy such as heat or light turns a soup of organic molecules into a tar-like substance. The mystery of how living organisms sprung out of lifeless rock has long puzzled scientists. See, that's a fancy way of saying we don't know. Despite decades of research, how life began on Earth remains one of the most challenging scientific, scientific conundrums facing modern science. And the single cells became plants and animals. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Understanding how and when animals evolved has proved very difficult for paleontologists. Very difficult, that's an understatement. So we are almost as much in the dark today about the pathway from non-life to life as Charles Darwin was when he wrote, it is mere rubbish to be thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well have think of the origin of matter, which we'll talk about tomorrow. There may have been minerals on the early earth that released such phosphorus nitrogen compounds under the right conditions Astronomers have found evidence for phosphorus nitrogen compounds in the gas and dust of interstellar space. So it's certainly plausible that such compounds were present on the early Earth and played a role in the emergence of the complex molecules of life. I love the certainly plausible. Yeah. Certainly plausible. Okay, well, this person does live in an alternate universe. All right. So here's what happens. In the 2016 paper published in Nature Chemistry, Jack Shostak, a Nobel Prize laureate and professor of genetics at Harvard, claimed that he had discovered a way for RNA to replicate itself, to copy itself. A powerful proof, proof for the evolutionary model of the beginning of life. One of his colleagues, tried to replicate his results. You know, what part of the scientific method is to see if you get the same results under the same conditions, see if this is really for real, reproducible. That's part of the test of the scientific method. But he tried but could not replicate the results. After that, Shostak admitted that his results were inconclusive. In retrospect, we were totally blinded by our belief in our findings. Ooh. So he was forced to admit that. 
we were not as careful or rigorous as we should have been in interpreting these experiments. Well, when you really desperately want to have proof for something, you believe whatever you can to have that confirm your desire and the thing you want to believe. We all do that in one thing or another. But these guys make a profession out of it. So subjecting amino acids to repeated, these are more recent attempts of trying to figure out other ways to explain how amino acids can come into existence uh, naturally with no supernatural creation going on. So subjecting amino acids to repeated wet-dry cycles could have been a good recipe for cooking up, I like the pun, cooking up peptides and proteins, peptides meaning amino acids, and proteins on the early Earth, as hot sunny days interrupted by occasional rainstorm seem like reasonable weather patterns. But a major criticism of this process is the reliance on unpredictable storms that may have watered down the ingredients. See, and that brings up another point. By having more water, you make the solutions less concentrated, and so the molecules would be more... Uh, difficult in finding each other. But no one ever talks about the products, these amino acids, interacting with other stuff in the primordial soup. No one ever talks about that, which would certainly mess everything up as well. Okay, here's another way they're trying to explain it. This is just from last year. Tiny gas-filled bubbles in porous rock around hot springs thought to have played an important role in the origin of life. Temperature differences at the interface between liquid phases could therefore have initiated prebiotic chemical evolution. See all the fuzzy language could, thought to have. A plethora of physical chemical processes must have created, so now they're resorting to the magic words, magic verbs, must have created the conditions that enabled living systems to emerge on the earth. The era of biological evolution must have been preceded by a presumably protracted, meaning drawn out, so that would be the fuzzy, fuzzy language, phase of prebody chemical evolution. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Now, I don't know, to me, whether they prefer a pond or an ocean, so what? But, you know, some prefer ponds, some of them prefer oceans. Beats me. Scientists believe there could have been enough lightning cracking through the atmosphere. Okay. Well, there's lots of problems for the evolutionary model. It's, it's all random chance stuff. It's all speculation. And it's, you know, it's against the laws of science. Again, with the lightning, it would destroy what it would make. So here's the business of the hot-dry cycles, uh, how they're trying to say this might make amino acids bond together, alternating wet and dry. Another theory here is that radiation from radioactive elements in the soil would provide energy to cause chemical reactions to happen. Uh, they also talk about here, it's possible that some, some of these molecules that are made in chains, how they manage to get the chains together, would then act like enzymes. Enzymes speed up chemical reactions. So it may be reasonable to assume, so there we are assuming once again, modern organisms may not be very similar to the first organisms. And so what they're saying is, since we can't figure out how this happened with the laws of chemistry and physics that we know now, maybe there was something very different that went first, and then it became what we know today. See, lots of hopeful, wishful thinking. Okay, so here's a situation where protoenzymes, meaning first enzymes, saying there must be some kind of a molecule which would speed up these chemical reactions to make them happen. And so they dream up these various things, uh, seeing if they might actually have done something and so that they can get the results of some proteins from the amino acids. 
And so these are various structures that they would like to see acting as enzymes, but look how complex these are. You know, these are not things that would just fall together very simply. And you also have to have the right temperature for a chemical reaction to happen. You have to have the right acid-base balance. That's what the pH means, the right amount of acid-base product. So yes, you can get these kinds of things to happen, but again, it took intelligence to figure all this stuff out and put it together. So proteins are chains of amino acids. They form structural components, function as enzymes. Proteins also act as transport molecules, for example. Um, you have something called albumin in your blood, which is a general transport truck. Hemoglobin transports oxygen, ferritin transports iron in the blood, lots of those. So there's many different functions for proteins. Um, it, besides making up the structural parts, making up the hair or the skin or the muscle or parts of the bone. So here we are, the probability, as I mentioned, with the getting the right amino acids together, just for 100 amino acids, it, the probability is one times 10 followed by 130 zeros. That's a fun, and that's just for one lousy protein. Not even of average size. Not even of average size. So multiply that times the thousands of proteins in each cell. It, it simply is mathematically impossible. Again, only left-handed amino acids are used in structural proteins. And just one wrong one can cause disease or death. That's what we call mutations. When you get a mutation in your DNA, it causes the wrong amino acid to be put into a protein, and then death or disease. Very well-known example is sickle cell anemia. The number six amino acid, valine substitutes for glutamic acid, and you get the wrong shape of the hemoglobin molecule, which makes the wrong shape of the cell into the shape of a sickle instead of a hockey puck plugs up the uh, capillaries, oxygen can't get to the tissues, tissues die, patient does not do well. So did life start in the oceans? Well, even now the evolutionists are saying, ponder ocean. Some of them are realizing, no, this is not possible. Why? Because water will break down the DNA. Hydrolysis means water breaking. Water will break down the DNA. The DNA will dissolve in the water. So now, what do they say? What's the alternative here? Well, now they're saying to form crystals in clay. DNA crystals in clay. So it becomes more and more improbable as they try to deal with the realities of real chemistry. So here is a real conundrum for the evolutionists. We need proteins, we need RNA, and we need DNA to make all three of these things. You need all three to make all three. So you need DNA and RNA and enzymes, proteins, in order to be able to make RNA. RNA is, among many other things, the messenger that takes information from the DNA and the nucleus into the little factory, the ribosome, to make the proteins. But you also need RNA and proteins and the DNA information to make proteins. And you also need the proteins, the enzymes, and the DNA and RNA to make DNA. So you need all of these things all the time to do anything. There's no way any of this could happen by itself without all of it being there at the same time in the right place and the right amount and the right orientation. Well, you know, Yale is known as being one of our more liberal universities in the country. And here's a computer science professor who says publicly to his colleagues, evolution doesn't work. So of course he's lambasted by his colleagues, but he said, look guys, face reality. It doesn't work. You, you know, this isn't what's going on. 
Now, he doesn't say you need to turn to Christ, but at least he's taken that first step towards the truth. And that's the issue, and that's why we're here today, is so that we can be better armed with simple facts to share with people in casual conversations. You know, no, it doesn't have to be a university level lecture. Just any one of these points, of these 11 points I made, any one of them kills that whole experiment. You know, and just to be able to share them with folks and just say, hey, have you ever thought? The idea is to get people to start thinking. And that's the issue is our educational system for quite a few decades has not been educating, it's been indoctrinating indoctrinating, dumbing down. And so if we can stimulate people to think, the great majority of folks who think they believe in evolution just simply have unthinkingly swallowed what they've been taught, what they've been indoctrinated with. And that's the category I was in when I came out of high school. I just accepted what I was told. I didn't think about it. You know, it took me quite a few more years and for the Holy Spirit to work on me before I start thinking for myself. Then, you know, folks can, can be led to the truth. So the great majority of folks just simply haven't bothered to think about the subject matter. They just swallow what they're told. Then there's a smaller group who are very dedicated to evolution on the whole, but realize, especially among scientists, in their own field, it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work in my field, but it must work in all these other fields. And then some of them finally realized, like Dean Kenyon, who is a, a molecular biologist, biochemist, said, hmm, it doesn't work in my field, and my field is so essential, that means it can't work at all. And he came to the truth. Then there's the third group, who are these dedicated, super dedicated, rabid priests of evolution, who are extremely anti-Christian, anti-biblical, uh, secular humanists who, who are sometimes very vicious in what they have to say. And the poster child for that is Richard Dawkins, who is a professor emeritus at Oxford, retired now, who has written over 15 books on the subject matter. And some of the quotes he has are unbelievably vicious against God and Christianity. It's amazing. I would, don't want to be him when he stands in front of the Lord. So the great majority of people are amenable to the truth because they're not committed you know, wholeheartedly to this business of evolution. They just have unthinkingly swallowed it. So that's why we do what we do is so you folks can be better armed because we need everyone to be in the army to share this truth with other folks. You know, you don't have to get up and on a podium and do this kind of thing. Just casual conversations with folks, simple facts, just bring up simple little things. You know, even if you just remember one-tenth of this, that'll be enough to do the job. So why don't we take a break, give you guys a chance to take a look at the resources. In the New Answers book, uh, volume two, there is a chapter involving this particular subject matter, along with about 30 other chapters of great stuff. And uh, Volumes 1 and 2 we have quite a few copies of. Volume 3 we only have one copy of, so someone better make a mad dash and get Volume 3. <laughs> and be, don't, don't snooze, don't lose. All right, so we'll take a break and then we'll reassemble after a bit and we'll do, do the second uh, presentation. All right.